All right, I see the Zoom room is filling up. Welcome to a special edition of Coffee Hour. We are visiting today with Mara Kiesling, the founding executive director for the National Center of Transgender Equality. As always, we want to know who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. You can put that information in the chat box or in the comments on Facebook Live. We will be starting our conversation in just a minute or two. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Coffee Hour. Again, let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from. Welcome to our audience on Facebook Live. Good to welcome you in to a special Tuesday edition of Coffee Hour Tuesday. It's at noon, special time, special day uh, for a wonderful conversation that we have lined up for you today with Mara Kessling. She is the founding executive director for the National Center for Transgender Equality. Great conversation coming up in just a minute or two. For those of you who are joining us here in Zoom, you can activate the closed captions by seeing the instructions that are just been placed in the chat on how you can activate your closed caption experience should you need to utilize those services. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As always, we are recording this session, and closed captions are available for this event. You can find that information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. Well, we are talking with Mara Kessling. She is the founder and executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, the nation's leading social justice advocacy organization, winning life-saving change for transgender people. Mara's strategy and vision have guided NCTE's work since 2003. She has led organizational and coalition efforts that have won significant advances in transgender equality, including the inclusion of gender identity in the Federal Employment Non-Discrimination Act from 2007. Onward and countless other federal and state level wins. Mara is also the co-author of Injustice at Every Turn, a groundbreaking 2009 report of the Transgender Discrimination Survey and the report of the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey. As one of the nation's leading voices for transgender equality, Mara is regularly quoted in national and local print media and has appeared on major television networks, including being part of the first all transgender panel, panel on a national news show in 2012. Mara received a bachelor's degree from Penn State Harrisburg and did graduate work in American government at Harvard University. Prior to founding NCTE, Mara worked for 25 years in social marketing and in opinion research. It is my pleasure to welcome to Coffee Hour, Mara Kessling. Mara, welcome to Coffee Hour. How are you today? Paul, good afternoon. I'm doing great, thank you. And thank you for that kind introduction. Absolutely. Well, first, let's start. My pronouns are he, him, and I want to invite you to share your preferred pronouns. And my pronouns are she. Excellent. Let's start right at the beginning. How did you become a Penn Stater? Well, I, um, though I was born in Scranton, I grew up uh, in the suburbs of Harrisburg and went to Susquehanna Township High School in case anybody 
uh, on the Zoom is, is from Susquehanna Township. And, um, you know, Penn State was a known, um, was, was obviously a known entity. A bunch of folks from my high school went. And um, I was, um, yeah, it was, uh, I, you know, it, it was where I picked. It was, I, I went to, uh, though I graduated from Penn State Harrisburg, I actually started it, um, in State College. Um, so it was far enough away that I was away, but close enough to home that I could get home on a bus on weekends if I had to. Absolutely. Already a lot of connections. So I'm a native of Scranton. I was born in uh, Scranton, raised, I, I consider Hazleton to be my, to be my hometown. Um, and, and then you mentioned Susquehanna Township. One of my college teammates at Bloomsburg is the head football coach at Susquehanna Township, Joe Heaton. So shout out to to yeah, Joe yeah. And, and coaching at Susquehanna Township. When you were either here at University Park or at Penn State Harrisburg, what were you involved in as a student? Well, I was, um, I was a kind of a unique student in that uh, I had a job in Harrisburg. Um, so even, even as a freshman, um, I was going home as often as I could to, to work for a political polling firm. Um, and then when I was at Penn State, then I took five years off to work for the polling firm. Then when I went back to Penn State Harrisburg, it was, uh, it was also to start the Survey Research Center at Penn State Harrisburg. So I was a full-time staff member at Penn State Harrisburg while I was finishing my last uh, year or so. So I, I didn't really participate in a lot of, of uh, extramural activities. Um, I was working. Well, it sounds like you were you were getting started on your resume with some really early pro professional experience there and and working. I I'm, I I did a little bit of background research. I'm I'm wondering if some of that was related to the work that your father did in in state government and some of the polling work that you were doing. Um, probably indirectly. Uh, I, you know, I we were a very political family. We watched the news every night. And the news was always on. And I grew up, you know, kind of around politician types and civic leaders. And um, it just seemed natural to me that I would sort of go in that direction. Absolutely. If I'm recalling, I think your father was the communications director uh, for, for the governor of Pennsylvania for a time. He, he was the um, communications director for governor's. Governor Scranton from 1962 to 66, but then he was, uh, and by the way, Governor Scranton was a Republican governor. Right. Um, and then when Bob Casey became the governor in 86, my father became his first chief of staff and he was a Democratic governor. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting, being working on both sides of the aisle. And, and, and to some extent during that period of time, the, the parties continued to change and shift and uh, go in different directions. So what are some of your favorite memories from your time spent at Penn State? Well, it's funny you should ask that now, Paul, because I just had one the other day. I was standing in line to buy some food and a song from 1976, which would have been my senior year in high school, um, it's called The Lido Shuffle uh, by Boz Skaggs. And it was part of the, part of the disco kind of thing. And um, when I heard the song, less than a week ago, my feet started dancing to it. And I realized <laughs> right away that it was some really weird muscle memory from 1977 and my orientation week at Penn State when there was a how to do the hustle session in South Halls and me and a couple of friends from East Halls, I, I lived in Pinchot Hall at the time, we walked down to uh, South Halls and learned how to do the hustle. We were actually, you know, looking to meet people. To tell you the truth, I was—I've always been dance neutral or dance negative. Um, but I, that memory came back to me like weirdly, and I, you know, I just remember the freedom of being away from my family. Not that there's anything wrong with my family, but it was the first time I was really away and. Um, got to meet people as an adult on, on my own terms, as kind of an immature, slightly out of control adult, but um, an adult nonetheless. Probably, uh, probably what we might consider a, a typical 
first year student, if you, if you will. Right. Um, that's pretty close. Yeah. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined today by Mara Kessling. She's the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Well, Mara, as I was doing some research, I noticed that you participate in the University of Minnesota's Transgender Oral History Project. And during that interview, you mentioned some of your, the, the, the question I believe you were asked is, what are just some of your earliest memories, right? And, and, and it took you back to being a, a young child, but some of your earliest memories were, were being aware of, of your gender. Can you talk a little bit about that awareness? You know, you mentioned, you know, before people are even given names, right? They are, they are given a gender. You're having a boy or you're, you're, having, you're having a girl. Uh, what, was that, what was that impact on you? Well, I guess I'll never know what the impact was, but I, I, I'm trying to sort that out now um, as I try to write a book. Uh, but I have thought about my gender um, every day of my life um, since I was, I don't know, three or whenever we have memories. Um, I knew I knew that it wasn't right. I didn't have the words for it. I, I don't even think transgender or transsexual even were words at the time. Maybe transsexual was. But there, there were no words for it. There were no role models. There was no way to get information. You know, I, I tell this story, which my family now tells me is not accurate, but I will relate it anyway. And I will re relate it with the embellishments that I've, I've added to it for um, educational purposes. So things are so different now where parents can actually find information and help their kids. But you know, in the early 60s, when I was three, um, the story goes that I put my sister's brownie uniform on and went to my parents and said, see, I'm a girl and I'm going to be a girl now. Right. And um, that part I thought was true, but how I've embellished it is then my father sat down at the computer and Googled transgender to try to find out how to help. And my mother said, what are you doing? It's 1963, we don't have computers. Um, you know, my parents are wonderful. Well, my, my mother passed away in April, but my, my father's a fantastic person. My mother was a fantastic person and they were so supportive of me and amazing there was nothing they could do for me in 1963. This right. wasn't really a thing. Um, the, the kids who were brave enough and, and solid enough to come out and survive it um, are just real heroes of mine. And I just knew I should just shut up and, and keep it to myself. So um, that's what I did, but I've thought about it every day of my life. And it is certainly, if nothing else, been a huge distraction that didn't need to happen. Um, if I had been able to, to fully realize all of me, I think, um, I think I could have, um, I could have focused on more, more things. Um, instead, I was just trying to figure me out uh, all by myself. Yeah. You mentioned in that interview that you were good at playing the part that you were assigned to. But, but at some point you wanted to be you. What was, what was that point for, for you and how did you kind of process what that journey might look like for you? Well, so I am not somebody who thinks of my life in a clearly defined pre-transition and post-transition way. I, I am not embarrassed or ashamed of my previous name or my previous life. Um, it, is, it, it is my context, it is what I was born into and what I survived and, and, and did quite well at. Um, uh, it was very hard and it was very lonely and I, you know, I couldn't talk to anybody about this most important thing in my life. Um, and that was um, very hard and probably scarring, um, but that's, that's what it was. Where it changed was in the early 90s with um, the popularization of the internet. And um, for the first time in my life, I was not the only person who felt this way, who thought this way, who wanted these things. Um, there had been a, occasionally signs of life from, from other folks, um, 
in unusual places like in songs like Lou Reed's Take a Walk on the Wild Side or The Kinks Lola. Um, I, those are representations that would probably really anger people today. But at the time, they for folks like me, they were kind of hope. And once the 90s happened and the internet happened and AOL happened um, and we started finding out about each other and we started meeting each other and um, supporting each other. Um, that's when, um, that's, that's when I knew that, that everything was possible. It wasn't a question of it's hard and I don't want to do it. It was simply a question of it was impossible and then it was not impossible. Um, and that's, that's hard for, for I think younger folks to to get, I, I, I did a year at the University of Chicago in between my Penn State times. And I was speaking there a few years ago and the first question from a student was, how was the administration on trans issues we, when you were there? Right. And I was like, it was the early eighties. There were, there were no trans students. You know, there were no trans students at Penn State in the late seventies. Of course there were. Right. But all of us were, um, I don't even wanna say closeted because it, it wasn't even that, it wasn't a possibility. Um, there was, when I went, when I left for Penn State in 1977, I don't know if this is correct, but I believe it must be correct. There was not a single trans kid in any kind of school anywhere out. There were no kids in elementary school, high school, college, grad school, professional schools. It was not possible. And, um, and now there's barely a school of any kind anywhere that doesn't have trans kids in it. And, well, things have certainly things have certainly changed over the years. I, was, um, I, I just one just has to look at your website to see now the many different policy issues and areas for advocacy that's needed for the trans community. And so we're going to get to all of that. But I want to start with uh, a tweet from President Biden uh, this morning to transgender Americans across the country especially the young people who are so brave. I want you to know your president has your back during Pride Month and all the time. What does it, what does a, a tweet and a message like that from the highest office of our land kind of signify to the transgender community? Yeah, and it's from our fellow Scrantonian, by the way. Yes, it is. It's really great. Um, it's, you know, it's really amazing. Um, the president, uh, I think, as everybody knows, is is a genuinely caring person. Um, you know, he he is set to become the probably the most progressive president of our lifetimes. Right. Um, but in addition to that, he's a very deeply caring person, and and I have spoken with him about trans people, and he really, really deeply cares. He knows trans people. He has trans people in his life, and um, and and trans people particularly trans kids need that so much right now when we're being attacked all over the country by these rogue state legislatures that are that are just using trans kids as political fodder um you know they we we had a bunch of years where they were trying to keep kids out of using the bathroom at school and using the bathroom in public and and now they've changed and now they're going after kids playing sports and and you know this isn't elite athletes um, that's been a red herring, you know, claiming that it's about elite athlete. It's not, it's about the ninth grader who wants to be on the JV bowling team and, and, you know, things like that. So having the president of the United States say he has our back and to, and by the way, to back that up with policies, we've seen already dozens of policies and we're going to see dozens and dozens more over the next four years. Um, it, it, it will have a real impact policy wise. But just, um, I don't know, emotionally and politically, to know the President of the United States is on your side is a really big deal. Absolutely. It's, it's well documented, his relationship with Sarah McBride. When you say he knows trans people, I mean, trans people have spoken at the Democratic National Convention now because of, because of President Biden. But um, I think the Biden, um, Sarah McBride's kind of family connection going back to Beau Biden um, is, is, is well documented of, of his support for, for the transgender community. You are 
Um, so I, I want to talk about what led you from kind of leading your own kind of personal journey to then wanting to become um, and kind of feeling the calling to become an, an advocate for others and an activist in this in this space. So really, it's the question kind of what led you to form uh, to found the National Center for Transgender Equality, but but more so kind of what was the calling that you felt to speak out for others? Um, well, there's a Penn State story here right. that's that's super pivotal to my activism. Um, but I'd say in general, um, you know, some people are just raised to speak out and to, to do things that are good for society and good for people. And, and I think I was raised that way. And so it was an imperative for me in that sense. But in particular, the logistics of it were, um, I, I transitioned um, in 2000. Um, I started going to support groups in maybe 1998. Um, I'd been to an occasional one before that, but I was in a support group meeting in 2000. And um, um, a friend said he was going up to State College that Friday to participate in a, in a job fair panel for queer students. Um, and, uh, and I was like, oh, did you go to Penn State? He said, no, I didn't go to Penn State, but they couldn't find a trans Penn State alumni. And I said, well, I'm, I am one and I, I don't wanna upset the apple cart this time, but you know, if you wanted somebody to ride up with you, I've got Friday free. So I went up to this job fair and did not participate in it, just was there as a participant. But I met Sue Rankin, who was a professor and um, I, I think was trying to start at the time the Center for Sexual and Gender Minorities. And um, when Sue met me, and found out that I, at the time, I think I was teaching political science, <laughs> including a course on lobbying. And she was like, is there any chance? And, and Sue was also running the statewide Pennsylvania Rights Coalition, which was a predecessor to Equality Pennsylvania and what it sounds like. And um, Sue asked me if I would sometime be willing to go and um, go with her and lobby state legislators. And my office at the time was about a hundred yards from the state capitol. So um, that's how I got involved in, in LGBT and queer and trans activism. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Center for Transgender Equality. What's the mission? What's kind of, what does the, the day-to-day -day leadership of that organization look like for you? <laughs> so it's there's funny. a lot there, right? Yeah, it's really funny you should ask that. So I, I, I know you know Paul, but maybe people don't. Uh, in uh, Earlier this year, I announced that I wasn't going to renew my contract and that this summer I was going to leave the National Center for Transgender Equality. And we're in that transition stage where, uh, honestly, I don't know what the leadership's like. Uh, uh, Rodrigo uh, hang Leighton and my successor and I are doing the best we can of handing stuff off from me to him. This is not a good time to talk about what the day-to-day -day leadership is because sure, it, sure. it's fluid. Um, but, it, but I'll tell you, we're doing a great transition uh, nobody does transitions like trans people. Um, so we're doing a great transition from me to Rodrigo um, that I think he and I are both really proud of. But NCTE is um, first and foremost, uh, a, a policy organization. Um, we our, our theory of change is that, that policy change can, can really dramatically impact people's lives. So we don't, we're not a grassroots support campaign or a support organization. We don't provide grassroots services to people. Right. Um, we, we change policy. Um, that's, that's what we do. And we have been just incredibly successful at it. Um, there has not been a social justice movement, at least in the United States, that's moved this fast. Right. Um, we went from 20 years ago where, um, you know, I, I was meeting with the minority leader of the Pennsylvania State Senate, who was a relatively liberal Democrat, and he wouldn't put trans people into the gay hate crimes bill. And he just said, oh, we'll lose all of our votes. Um, and then he looked at me and he said, but Mara, look at the bright side. A couple of years ago, I wouldn't have let you in my office. And um, by the way, like six weeks later, we passed this bill through the Senate with trans people in it 
we got every single Democrat and 13 Republicans. It's still one of only two bills ever in, in LGBT history that passed through a state house, a Republican state house, Republican state Senate and was signed by a Republican governor. Um, uh, don't know what story, what I, what I was answering. What was the question? Uh, just the, the day-to-day work of... <laughs> So yeah, we're into a lot of things. We're into federal policy um, in terms of education, healthcare, um, criminal justice reform, immigration. Um, when NCTE was started, um, what we were trying to do was twofold. Number one, we were trying to create a voice for trans people um, in Washington, DC and in state capitals. And we've been incredibly successful at that. The other, the other thing we were trying to do is really trying to make what had been the gay rights movement into a real genuine LGBTQ movement. And again, we were so successful at that, that um, it's probably gone a little bit too far, uh, in my opinion. Um, and here I'm not speaking for the organization or for my successor, but in my opinion, we now have most of the big um, LGBT organizations doing almost nothing but trans work and hmm. trampling all over the trans people who are trying to do trans work. Um, so we've been really successful at that. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, that's what we do. We're, we're a voice, not the voice for trans people in public policy. So you, you recalled the question that you received at the University of Chicago when they asked, how was the institution on transgender issues. And, and at the time there were no transgender issues, right? But now today, look at, I look at the website and there is no fewer than two dozen different policy um, initiatives or policy areas with, with so much work to be done. How do, you, how do you determine what your annual agenda is going to look like? Is it when flames start to, um, are ignited around you, you you brought up high school high school student athletes and and where student athletes can compete we we're going to get to talking about the use of restrooms um, but there's there's inequality in the military there's inequality in in education and access to education how do you pick what the annual agenda might look like for a national organization like the NCTE yeah well i'm not I'm not going to try to pull up and show everybody our our agenda setting matrix, right. but it's it's actually really pretty complicated. It starts with one very simple rule, which is we try to focus on the work that the people who need us the most need the most. So um, um, that's why we've had a commitment to criminal justice reform, to immigration detention issues. Um, we're not an immigration group, but there's hardly anybody better, uh, better situated to advocate for better conditions for trans people in immigration detention. And those are among our most vulnerable people. Um, trans, uh, black trans women who are being murdered at a incredibly disproportionate rate. Right. They are people who need us the most. And so we focus on things like that. The truth is, that there are confounding issues to that. If the president of the United States says, we are about to start doing, you know, working on this policy for trans people, that has to become a priority for us. Right. Um, so, you know, the trans military ban is a really good example. We knew that was going to happen, potentially could happen the first day or so of the Biden administration. And so a lot of our work over the last two years was advocating with all of the presidential campaigns on that issue um, so that that could sort of take care of itself. Now, it, there's a good argument to be made that trans service members are not the people who need, it, the, need our help the most, um, but it is the federal government, the largest employer in the United States discriminating against trans people. And so that has to end and we had to be part of that. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of that. Then sometimes we do things as stepping stones. We know we have this goal um, and we see a little opportunity to just, um, uh, I'm gonna do a sports analogy, which is always yeah. super dangerous, but 
Um, I like to think of us as kind of a running back and we look for little holes and sometimes we gain two yards and sometimes we go all the way. And um, that's sort of how we set our agenda. Um, there's a lot more issues like things just come up, um, allies, you know, um, ask us to participate in something like we're, we're doing some work now on voting rights. Um, it may not be something we, you know, we just didn't have to prioritize that because it was going to happen anyway. And, and it's super important to trans people. So we had to engage in it. So it's a, it's a really complicated thing, but we start with who needs us the most, the most, and that's what we work on. So it was interesting that you brought up during your answer, criminal justice, uh, because that, you know, that to me seems like an area where you uh, I don't want to say intentionally, intentionally pick the fight, but you're an activist and in your activist role in 2016, you were protesting the, the North Carolina law prohibiting people from choosing the bathroom, rather um, mandating that they use the restroom matching their assigned sex at birth. Now, you were, you were arrested, not, you were arrested for trespassing, not for using the, the, well, the wrong the wrong restroom, which I love, by the way, that you could have used any any government owned restroom in the state of North Carolina, but you chose to use the governor's restroom to to protest and then to uh, and then to have your sitting. You were arrested for for trespassing, but I, I thought that that was um, knowing how transgender people um, are, you know. Are, are treated by the criminal justice system, that it was not only, um, you know, it was not only inspiring to see you stand up um, and, and protest in that way, but to do it in a way where you're putting yourself in harm's way. Talk a little bit about that experience in 2016 in North Carolina and, and the gains that you were able to make for the transgender community because of that protest. Yeah. Yeah, like all things, it was a sort of a complicated situ situation. In some ways, it was super simple. The state legislature and the governor did something absolutely disgusting, disgraceful for political purposes. There was there, there were not people coming home and saying, honey, there's transgender people everywhere in the bathrooms and we need to do something about it. Let's call the senator. It was political purposes. It was shameful. Um, I was at the hearing um, the day it passed, the hearings the day it passed, and in the Senate hearing, this amazing teenager named Sky um, stood up and, and looked at this, all of these state centers. This is a 16-year-old, and he said, I go to school every day worried that I'm going to be bullied by students, worried that, that a teacher might bully me, and now you're telling me that state senators are bullying me and my governor is bullying me? This is not okay. And if Sky could do that, you know, what did I have to be afraid of? And um, so a couple weeks after it passed, um, Reverend um, William Barber, who runs the North Carolina NAACP chapter and is becoming quite a, a well-known guy around the country, he, he's been doing a thing in North Carolina called Moral Mondays, where they protest every Monday. And he wanted to do a big protest one Monday and focus on this bathroom bill, HB2. And so we were asked to participate in that and, and what just an incredible, incredible honor. And the organizers of the event wanted some arrestees. Um, and um, I just don't know how I could have not been there. Um, they had organizers from SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee, I messed that up from the 60s, the, the guy who trained us on how to be arrested had been arrested over 70 times. And, um, and I did the training on trans people who wanted to be arrested. I think it turns out I'm pretty sure I was one of only two trans people who were arrested that day. Um, and there were like 50 of us arrested. Um, but the, the two of us who were trans, we had, um, we had lawyers assigned to us by, by the NAACP. Um, who were buddies and who just basically refused to cooperate with the police unless they were able to stay with us. I, you know, I don't think I was ever in any danger. Um, you know, at a 
political protest at a Capitol building. Right. Um, and I'm the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. They were professional and the, the police were professional and they were taking orders and they treated everybody with kid gloves like you'd expect. So I, I never, I don't think I was ever in any kind of danger and I really wasn't worried about that. So for the, you mentioned uh, Reverend William Barber, for those interested in learning more about him, there's a great New Yorker radio hour podcast from early January with David Remnick, where they feature um, William Barber on faith and politics. And that's one of my podcasts that I listen to. And so uh, check out uh, that episode of the New York radio, New Yorker radio hour with uh, Reverend William Barber. Public transportation, I'm thinking now back to the 60s, public transportation, water fountains, restrooms, lunch counters, just a few of kind of the battlegrounds where the fight for civil rights occurred. You, you experienced this, right? We just used the example of, of restrooms or use the example of participation in high school sports. How much does fear of the unknown and fear and kind of ignorance drive where these battles are fought? Because you, you use the great example, no one's coming home from work and saying, I've had this experience, right? It's being used for uh, by politicians for political gain. Um, but, but that's where you're kind of forced to, to fight these battles. Talk a little bit about how much fear plays a, plays a part in this. Um, well, I, I, I wanna talk about how much fear has played a part in this. Right. And, and now it's less fear than deliberate ignorance. Um, we're coming to a place in our society where everybody on all sides of the, uh, on all places of the spectrum are deliberately only learning what verifies what they already think. So this is true of conservatives, it's true of people who don't care, it's true of liberals and progressives. Um, people are becoming deliberately ignorant and I, I'm really worried about that. But how it has been is yes, a combination of ignorance and fear and ignorance and fear are not unrelated, of course. Um, you know, the, the loss of the Equal Rights Amendment in the um, early 80s um, is attributed often to the arguments that it would cause there to be no more women's and men's rooms. And right. women were terrified of having men in the, in, in the, in the women's room. Um, and the, the Black Civil Rights Movement had a lot of fights and skirmishes and outright wars about um, public facilities like bathrooms and, and whether or not um, races could mix. I, I don't know what it is about that. Um, smarter people than I have analyzed that. Um, but it's, um, it's often fear and ignorance. And why the trans rights movement and the gay rights movement um, I'm deliberately calling it the gay rights movement in this instance, why they've moved so fast is, is because we've been telling our stories and we have been educating our families and our coworkers and, and the people we worship with. That's the most important thing any queer person does um, for, for queer equality, queer liberation. Um, and, and we, we haven't been, so we have, we've basically infiltrated every family. Um, I, of course, I'm using infiltrated tongue in cheek there. All we did was be born, but we're in every family now. And that is, um, that's winning over armies and armies of family members to our side. And that's why we're winning. That's the primary thing. So for, for movements to progress, right? You mentioned a number of different uh, civil rights movements throughout the history of, of our country. For them to make progress, it takes those from outside of the community, right, with privilege to kind of stand up next to, to people within the community and, and, and kind of fight alongside them and to be good allies. Can you talk about what it means to be a good ally for people in the transgender community? Yeah, um, just remember that the battle, the, the, the battle is yours. Um, when I, 
when I fight for immigration detention, um, I'm not thinking about you know those people. Right. Um, if you ever hear yourself thinking those people, or God forbid, saying those people, uh, adjust yourself. Um, those people are us people. Um, I, I don't happen to be an immigrant. I don't happen to be in immigration detention, but um, I know that if it's okay to hold an immigration detainee in solitary confinement for a year, it could easily be, um, I, you could easily do that to trans people or if it's okay to just randomly kill people because you hate them, I can't really complain if there people are going to do that to to me or my people. And um, I I just think being an ally means you, you have to feel an obligation to do something about it. And and what you do is is up to you and and your superpowers. You know, it's uh, we all care about different things. We all have different abilities. We all have different privileges, and um, and if you can bring yourself and your and, and and leverage yourself and your superpowers and your privileges and your shortcomings um, to help anybody, boy, you ought to do that. And um, I think that's what an ally is. And I, I don't think an ally has to get permission. Um, I I think we've. Um, gone a little bit too far in that direction. I, I don't think allies, as I described earlier with the LGBT movement, should be trying to run the show all the time. But, um, you know, you don't need permission to show up. You don't need permission to, to stand on the ramparts and pitch in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was talking to my daughters today about talking with you. And... Uh, you know, we got on to the topic of, you know, in, in a lot of cases, it's just being there for for the people you care about, right? I mean, uh, it, it's about being a good friend and, and supporting um, supporting the people that you're closest to and that you that you care about. And really, it starts there. And you've, you alluded to this, right? We now have the internet, right? We don't have to be, we don't have to be taught this, right? We can go out and find that information on our own and, and learn. And I will point people to transequality.org where there's just a treasure trove of information uh, that people can, can arm themselves with to know what the, um, what the policy initiatives might be for the transgender community and, and resources on how uh, you can, it's, it's the life, it's the guide to being a good ally. Um, you know, all those are readily available for those of us who who want more information about that. You mentioned earlier uh, in, that in March you announced and that you're going through a leadership transition at NCTE uh, and you're pending retirement. Congratulations on, on that. Uh, you, you were the founder and now you're, you're turning the reins over. But I would imagine that, um, that you're not done, that it's not uh, retirement and we're gonna go sit on a beach and. Um, and, and kind of let the, let the work that needs to be done to other people. So what's next for you? Yeah, it's definitely not retirement, um, was not meant to be retirement. So um, I just knew it was time. Um, I just sort of felt it was time. It's, it's been almost 20 years. Um, I've, I've always had my contracts, my employment contracts with uh, the organization to end. Uh, one year after a presidential election, because our, our work, particularly at the federal level, is so tied to who the president is. Right. Um, you know, in 2016, I wanted to be able to say, oh, so Hillary won or Trump won. I think I can still be helpful or I don't want to be helpful or whatever. Right. And leading up to this presidential race, um, I just I just knew that if Donald, uh, well, I don't want to get all partisan here. Sure, sure. Uh, but I... <laughs> I just knew if one of the presidential candidates won, I, it, it felt to me like such a threat to democracy that I was going to want to do something different and bigger and faster. Right. Um, and um, when the presidential election happened, I just knew. I, I just knew, um, even, though it, even though it went a different way, 
I still just knew I wasn't as I wasn't as needed. Um, and there was there were some other things I still wanted to be doing. So I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm I'm I am writing a book. Um, that's terrifying to say because um, it, it, there's an element of commitment to even saying it. But um, I, I do think what we did was so special um, from a social movement point of view, but also from a political science point of view, um, because we very intentionally broke some rules and um, did some things that the political scientists say probably wouldn't work. Um, and I think what we did, and, and I don't mean me, I mean right. we, um, uh, was really pretty brilliant. And, and there, there are lessons that could be learned from other movements. We went in 20 years from having no voice, no power, um, to having a really pretty strong, powerful voice that's, that's getting things done. And, um, and I'd like to tell that story. And then what else I'm gonna do, I don't know. Um, I think the lessons I've learned from this movement <coughs> would be incredibly helpful in several other kind of movements. <coughs> um, I've been a vegan for 25 years and um, animal rights and particularly the, the nexus between animal rights and the environment um, are incredibly important to me. Um, by the way, another favorite memory of my time at Penn State was that there was ice cream at every meal. Um, wow. Oh, we're going to talk about that in just a second. We're oh, we are, okay. A, a little more in depth on, on, on uh, the ice cream situation at Penn State and your involvement with that. This is the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by Mara Kessling. She was the founding director, founding executive director of the National Center for transgender equality. Well, let's let's dive into some of those more Penn State related questions. Um, how about let's start with your favorite class at Penn State? I had a history class. Uh, it was a post Civil War history class that I absolutely adored. Yeah. Um, it was. I don't even remember the professor's name, but it was. Um, it was in it was one of those really humongous classes, but I just loved it. Loved Excellent. It. We had a strong history department here at Penn State. Civil War and Reconstruction was one of the specialties. I remember when I was in um, when I was in school, we were always studying what the Penn State uh, professors were writing and researching on. If you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Huh. And if you're in DC, where would it be? <laughs> well, where it would be is a, a restaurant called Rasika. Um, it's on uh, Rasika West End in particular. It's a it's an Indian restaurant, but it's it's a dramatically updated Indian restaurant, and it's often thought to be one of the best restaurants in DC. I don't get to eat there often, and I absolutely love it. So it would be there. Um, I don't know. I've, you know, I, I've been so lucky that I've gotten to meet so many people. I, you know, I, this is going to sound corny, but I guess my mom, you know, we lost my mom to Alzheimer's last April, um, April, 2020, couldn't see her. Um, we're having her funeral finally later this month. Um, so I, I would, I would say my mom and I think she would like Rasika. Well, we are, we are so sorry for your loss and especially when you lost your mom, that it's, um, I'm sure some of that, that mourning has been kind of delayed in terms of getting some final closure because of COVID-19. How about uh, your most unusual we are moment, right? Where you heard somebody shout out we are and maybe it was a little bit out of context and you didn't realize that there might've been other Penn Staters around. Well, we don't do a lot of we are's here in DC and I don't know why. I've done it a couple of times when I've walked past people wearing like a t-shirt or a hat or something. And they always just look at me like, what? Cause they're usually in their twenties and I'm like 150. And so they're just like, why is this old person bothering me? But um, so I, I, I'll tell you one of my most recent touching Penn State thing, you know, this, and there was a we are kind of moment. I was at a, 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 a graduation kind of event um, with the Center for Sexual oh, Diversity yeah. 
probably four or five years ago, we were out on the hub lawn and, and having been so alone in my transness when I was at Penn State, and, I, and I'm actually an introvert. And so Penn State at first can be a really challenging place for an introvert. Right. And um, to see all of these fantastic queer kids who just were just so um, demographically, but also visually diverse. And you know, when I was when I was at Penn State, there weren't hair colors. Like your hair color was either black, brown, blonde, or red. Like that was really the choices. Right. Now it can be primary red, and you know, and I just seeing all these kids and how they were there for each other, and out on the, and 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 there were chants, and and it was amazing. I believe it's called the Lavender Graduation Ceremony, and it is it is a wonderful event. One of those um, one of those traditional and iconic end of semester events that now happen uh, on an annual basis here at Penn State. How about your favorite Penn State sport? Um, I'm really not a sports person. Um, so um, I would say the entire intramural program. There we go. Excellent. Everybody and, participated in it. And I promised we would get to it, and now is the opportunity. Uh, your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream. Okay, so remember, I haven't had creamy, creamery ice cream in at least 25 years because I've right. been a vegan that time. But when I was in state college, by far, it was just straight up chocolate. Um, I thought the, the creamery chocolate ice cream was magical. It, it was the best ice cream I had ever had. And I, I have been an ice cream aficionado my whole life. Um, and so chocolate, straight up chocolate. Excellent. Mara, if people want more information about how they can connect with you or the work that you're doing, I know Ms. Magazine mentioned that you were one of the top social media, top people in social media to follow in the, the transgender community. If people want to um, connect or get more information, how can they go about doing that? Well, just to be a little ornery again and iconoclastic, um, I got off social media a little more than a year ago. Um, NCTE is on it at Trans Equality. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. But I am detoxing um, from the toxicness that is social media. Um, but uh, you can find all about NCTE at transequality.org. Um, and they know where to find me if anybody ever needs me. And, and by the way, uh, the center um, at Penn State knows where to find me if you ever need me. So talk to Sonia, who I hope is watching. Absolutely. But, um, we dropped um, we dropped some of those links in the chat. If you're interested, uh, you can go ahead and copy and paste or click on those links uh, that we were just referring to. Mara, thank you so much for joining us on the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Our alma mater says, may our lives swell thy fame. And the work that you're doing is certainly done that. And for that, we're truly grateful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. If you are a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for joining us today and for your support. If you're not a member, what are you waiting for? Go to our website at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thank you for all you do for the university for the glory and for the future. We are. And state.